Good morning. Today, depending on what terminology you want to use, is our 23rd anniversary or 23rd birthday. I don't know which one's best, but yeah, 23 years ago, we had our opening Sunday. In uh, so many ways, I feel like I've spent 70% of my life in this church, and uh, and being that I was nine years old when the church started, <laughs> it probably works out mathematically too, right? <laughs> I want to ask a question. Um, we had five upstairs this last service. We had, I think it was about nine, eight or nine, somewhere in that neighborhood. So I'm going to ask the question here, and, and, and if you're going to lift your hand, lift it high. Um, if you were here on April 9th, 1995, not actually here, but at the school just down the road, April 9th, opening Sunday, 1995, lift, lift your hand up high. So I've got uh, three, four, five, six. All right, so good, good. Uh, so, so there's a few. But uh, it's getting to be a rare, uh, a rare animal now. You know, I call them antiques. I don't know what, what we'll call them, but uh, but yeah. So it's it's kind of cool every time that this rolls around. If you didn't come early, um, then I'm sorry you're out of luck because they're shutting down the the biscuits and gravy. But uh, everyone knows that in a wedding. Year 25 is what? Silver? Is that the thing? And 50 is gold and all of this, or at least that's the traditional thing. Well, as far as churches, when you're measuring anniversaries, 23 is biscuits and gravy. So that's, that's the way we celebrated today. I'm going to show you a video to start, start off, not just the message, but to start off a series, because we're starting a brand new series today. And uh, I wanted to preface it instead of having it play while I'm coming out because it is extremely brief, okay? It's only 15 seconds long. But what I want you to do is when you're watching this little video, I want you to kind of think back, okay, were you ever in this place? Did you ever witness this happening? Maybe even it happened to you, okay? So here it is. Yeah, I'm cutting it off right there <laughs> because it actually was another 20 seconds long, and uh, um, and part of that was a splice, so it actually covers more time. But the guy that's getting out of that car right now, um, he goes right up to the other car, and and he actually does some of the things. Not that I've thought, but some of you <laughs> that had someone steal your parking place, you thought of doing what this guy actually does. I mean, he goes up, and he grabs this guy and throws him to the ground. He gets in the car. He moves his car. <laughs> he gets back in his car and parks in the spot. Seriously. And there's even a couple of things after that, which I'm not even going to talk about that. But, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. But here we have an example of someone who stole a parking spot. How many of you ever had that happen to you? Okay, yeah, I figured, figured as much. A bunch of hands go up with that. And, you know, that really grates on us. That, that really has a way of irritating us. And part of the reason that it bothers us so much is because the person that steals the spot, it's like by that action, you, you kind of get a feel for their attitude, their mindset. And their mindset is basically they see themselves as being more important than you, right? Right? I mean, isn't that part of what goes with this? 
So, so on that basis, even though you were sitting there waiting for this spot, they should have it because they're more important than you. And that's part of what bugs us so much because, you know, we we're being polite. We were just sitting there and all and just waiting for the time to turn in. And then some guy out of nowhere just zips in there. And, and sure enough, I mean, that guy's probably thinking he has places to go, people to see and things to do. But the reality is you do too. It's just that yours isn't as important as his schedule. He's got his schedule to keep. And so, so that really bugs us. Now, I want you to know this wasn't the only camera that was recording this. There's actually another camera that got um, a closer view of the players involved in all this. So I, I want to show you that. There's a moral to this story, so just watch here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If we had the sound, there was actually a little whimper at the very end from that dog. But now, I mean, we, we all know that cats and dogs can't drive cars, Okay. But what we learn from this is that cat lovers are the kind of people that steal parking places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the next time that happens to you, you know that was a cat lover, right? So, and, and the next time you're invited to someone's house and you're sitting in the living room or in the kitchen or whatever and... and uh, um, a cat comes walking in. You know the kind of company you're keeping now. These are parking st spot stealers. Today we're starting a new series. Uh, and, and, and really, it, part of the reason why is because you don't want to be people like that, like what that guy was. The title of our series is Building Better Relationships. And uh, there will be relevance to the things that we're talking about in all four messages that um, will be beneficial, will be helpful as far as your marriage is concerned. Um, there will be things, principles and all that we'll talk about that will be beneficial uh, for your, your whole family, extended family. But the reality is um, I don't want to limit it in that way. We're going to be across the board. The things, the principles that we're going to be talking about in this series not only are beneficial in your home, but are going to be beneficial in your workplace and should be beneficial with total strangers as well. Okay, So across the board, we're going to be talking about relationships and, and improving uh, relationships. And, and for... This is where we're starting today. For our relationships to improve, we have honestly got to do a better job at valuing people. I think this is one of the most fundamental things, and that's why I wanted to start the series this way. We live in um, a world today, a society today, that is very me-first oriented. You know, and, and you know how we complain a lot, especially some of us that maybe are a little older, uh, we complain uh, too much um, about the sense of entitlement that seems to exist in our culture today, and uh, where people are just kind of putting themselves at the front of the line, and whether it's stealing a parking place or or a, a whole host of other possibilities, um, and. And we, we've got to head that off. And the best place to head that off is to improve relationships. But what does it look like to value someone? If we're actually going to put some feet on that, how do you go about doing that? Because we want to do that. We don't want to be like the guy in the video. Um, and perhaps this is... This would be a better symbol to use to kind of launch us into it. This needs to be more of the mindset that we have, is a willingness to yield, to yield the right of way. Even though by all rights, maybe we've got the right of way, but yet we're going to be intentional in yielding it. And a lot of the principles we're going to talk about today 
you know, are kind of illustrated by that uh, simple sign. So how is it that we value others? Let me share with you five specific things. Number one, it starts with how you greet people. Okay, this is, we're going to put this right at the top of the list because uh, greeting people, you kind of think of that as being first, first point of contact and all. Um, I've talked about some of these verses that I'm going to show you now um, a variety of times over the years. So let me just kind of quickly rattle through several of them here. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, he said this in chapter 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. In his second letter, he ended it basically verbatim saying the very same thing. Greet one another with a holy kiss. But it's not limited there. You can go elsewhere like his letter to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, greet all God's people with a a holy kiss. 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, Peter's going to get into the act as well. He's writing to Christians who are scattered Uh, due to persecution. He says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Slightly different terminology, but nonetheless, still a a similar comment being made. And then this this is the classic one uh, that people probably think of the most. Romans chapter 16, verse 16. uh, Easier to remember the chapter and verse combination there. uh, Where again, verbatim, he says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. And one of the reasons that we, we remember this, or at least I know I do, remember this one more than some of the others, is because of the context that it f- falls into. And in the first service, I actually went back and read a good chunk of it, but then discovered that we're going to be a little tight on time. So uh, I'll, I'll let you read it, but it, it starts way up in verse 3. And if you look at Romans 16, starting in verse 3, you know, Paul does a whole bunch of shout-outs as far as greet so-and-so and greet so-and-so on my behalf because they meant this to me and greet this person as well and the church it meets in their home and meet this or greet this person too because they really serve the Lord by helping me. And greet this part, and he just kind of goes, and he's mentioning all these people by name, but just verse after verse after verse after verse, you see, and and it's kind of like he's ramping up as this is the final chapter of his letter to the church in Rome, and and after saying all of those, greet this person, that person, and so on, then he kind of caps it all off by saying, "Uh, just greet one another with a holy kiss. So not only was he greeting people and wanted to be real specific, but then he basically turns and says, you guys ought to be doing this too. Greeting people. Greeting them with a holy kiss. Now, I've had fun with this in the past. There have been times I've had that same verse up on the screen, and and I stood up here and I said, I just want you to know I was standing back there in the shadows, and during the greeting time this morning I saw how you guys approach that. And we need to be people by the book. So I'm going to give you another chance. So everybody stand up and greet one another in a biblical way. You know, and, and you know, I've said stuff, and there, there's always a few people that have that look in their eye, and they're probably first-time folks, and they're like, I want to crawl under my chair right now. <laughs> this is scary. So we've had fun with, with the thought, but... In view of that, I just want to tack this on. There is a reason you find this so many times mentioned in the Bible. There is a takeaway here. There is a point that that God is wanting to make to us. A warm, meaningful greeting communicates something. It communicates If I give you a warm, meaningful greeting, it communicates something. That, that you're somebody, and I'm glad to see you today. And, and probably a variety of other things too, but, but it communicates something other than just a, you know, a casual routine, hi, and so on. It doesn't have to be a kiss, okay? And that's part of what makes it, these verses interesting is the holy kiss. But see, that's a cultural thing. Over in the Middle East, for the longest time, this has been the practice. In fact, in recent years, I've been over to Jordan twice, and, 
And uh, it's still part of their culture today. You know, when, when we'll be going from point A to point B in a man Jordan, um, you know, you're always watching out the windows at everything, just soaking it all in. And it's a very common scene to see somebody walking up to somebody's shop and the shopkeeper walking out, and this is the way they greet each other. You know, they give each other a kiss. So that's not just an ancient thing of the past. It's a cultural thing, a cultural thing that still continues. Um, I don't know as it's a cultural thing around here. I had an aunt that passed away a couple years ago, and this is why she always greeted people was with a kiss, including her nieces and nephews. You know, and that was, that was kind of weird, but, you know, but uh, so it was a cultural thing for her, but uh, um, it wasn't for my family, you know, so me and my siblings, we always thought that was kind of weird. Um, a hug, that could just as easily have been a hug, but even a hug can be a cultural thing. Plus, you throw in several other elements that can factor into why a hug might not be appropriate. Um, and, and there actually can be somewhat of an argument, you know, made to some of that. But a handshake, even a fist bump. I mean, you know, we, we smirk at that idea, but that, uh, even, even a hand on the shoulder, that's, that's a way that I a lot of times will, will greet someone or when I'm saying goodbye to them or something, it's, it's a hand on their shoulder. And when you look at the actual word that is used in the Greek, there's nothing special about this word, kiss. It's just your standard normal word for kiss in the original language. But one of the things that you notice, though, in the vast majority of these passages I had on the screen just a moment ago is, is they include the word holy right in front of it. Holy kiss. And there's the giveaway that, that this is more than just some run-of-the-mill routine type greeting. Holy means sanctified. So you could actually be talking about greeting one another with a, with a holy handshake or a holy hug or, you know, and, and still be getting across the point. When someone takes the time and effort to specifically greet you personally, especially if, if uh, there's a smile included, there's eye contact, uh, being made, and, and even they throw your name into it. And, all. And, and when someone does that, it conveys that you have value in their eyes. You see, this, this is something that, that is not just a run-of-the-mill, casual sort of a thing. We need to be in the moment when we're greeting people so that there's something genuine and, and there, there's something meaningful that's being communicated. And when I say be in the moment, I'm talking about stuff like body language and eye contact and all of that. You know, you know what it's like, and, and you probably do, we've all been there, where someone is greeting us and maybe they're shaking our hand or something, and as they say, hi, how are you? And so you start answering the question, and where are their eyes? Their eyes immediately go off of you and they're looking over their shoulder, and, and especially if there's other people floating around. And, and it kind of sends a message that that, well, they're talking to you right now because you're right in front of them, but they're really wanting to talk to someone else and they're trying to see if they can spot where they are. And what kind of message does that send to you? See, you're not being in the moment, you know, when you do that. And that's why body language and eye contact and all of that matters, even little details like uh, if, if the last time you had, had had a little visit with this person was three weeks ago and they mentioned something about their son-in-law and a diagnosis or something or other. And so now here you are three weeks later and you're greeting them and, and, and you say, oh, and by the way, I've been thinking about your son-in-law. How's he doing? You know, and I mean, not only are you going to shock them, because you remembered, but you are sending a very loud and clear message to them that they have value and their family has value to you. So that's what I mean by being in the moment and not just being a routine, a ritualistic sort of thing. I uh, still remember pretty vividly something that happened when I was in junior high. I'd never um, seen this sort of thing happen before. Um, it, it was during the school year, and, uh, and I, I was able to go out for sports, which uh, was a pretty major thing because um, we lived out in the country on a gravel road, and, 
And uh, my dad always operated by the mindset, with the mindset that sports are for city kids. And people that live out in the country, they've already got plenty of things to do. And uh, but kids in the city don't have anything to do. And so that's why sports were cooked up. And, and that's why schools have sporting programs and all this. And so that was basically my dad's m- mindset. And, uh, and I just wanted, I wanted to play sports. And, uh, and I was like the tallest kid in the class and everything. So I had several classmates that were like during foot, getting ready for football season. You got to go out. You got to be a part of the team. And, and so I would plead and plead with my parents just to make an exception to this. And finally, I was able to wear them down. And dad um, attached this condition onto it. He said, all right, I'm going to let you go out. But uh, uh, two things. You can't quit. You got to finish the season. And uh, secondly, you have to get there and get back. You have to take care of the transportation. Your mother and I, we are not driving to town and sitting in a parking lot and waiting for you to come out of a locker room. You have to figure that out. And here I am just going into my seventh grade year. And, uh, um, you know, and I'm just like, I had no clue how that was going to work. Because we were a little over a mile outside town, so it wasn't like, you know, long, long distance. So in the back of my mind, I knew if, if nothing else, I'll walk. And, uh, and so I, I took my dad up on it. I said, all right, I, I'll accept that. And so I went out, and I was thrilled about it. And, and I talked to some of my friends, and I found out one of my good buddies, he lived further away from town, another two or three miles uh, away and usually they would travel on this paved road to get to his house. But you could get there. It was that probably even shorter if you went on the gravel road and, and uh, uh, right past my house. And so I asked him to ask his dad because his dad always got off work and came through Silver Lake about 6.15 or 6.30 every evening. And uh, that wasn't right after practice. I mean, we'd have to wait around an hour and 15 minutes or so. But uh, um, at least then I would have a ride. And so uh, he and I were really good friends, and I had spent nights at his house. He had spent nights at my house, and, and, uh, and his dad, you know, was fine with it. He said, sure, I'll do that, no problem. And so I had it all in place. And so anyway, here after football practice, he and I would walk over to his uncle's house, which was real close to the school, and, uh, and we'd just go in and sit down and try to kill some time, and they had some games that sometimes we'd play, like there was that old basketball, you know, spring lever game, you remember that little thing, you know, and we were both real competitive, and we'd be sitting on the floor playing this, and this one, one day before his dad got there to pick us up, his uncle came home and come walk again. And he greeted my friend by name. And uh, my friend, we were right in the middle of competition. Time was about to run out. And, uh, and so he didn't even look up. And he just kind of gave some kind of a grunt response. You know, hey, you know, uncle so-and-so. And, and that was it. And didn't even look up. Just kept playing. And, and, uh, um, and the next thing I know, we're so absorbed in this game, we didn't even see the shadow approaching. The next thing I know, is that his uncle reached down and grabbed my friend by his hair, and we both had more of it, and it was longer in those days, grabbed my friend by his hair and lifted him up and then walked him to the door the whole time lecturing him about here I am opening up my home, allowing you to come into my home to wait for your dad to ride, and you don't even have the courtesy, the decent courtesy courtesy or respect to say hi to me when I say hi to you. And he just you know, was going on and on like that and went right to the door, opened it up, and said, you can wait outside. And uh, I didn't wait to be invited to the door. I was just like, man, I'm slipping out. And I was a lot skinnier in those days. And I just slipped right out as soon as I had that opportunity to. And, and we were sitting out there on the front step. And I was just like, whoa, what was that? That was wild. And, I mean, you know, it was back in the day when, you know, like my dad, you know, he'd discipline us with belts and, you know, stuff like I mean, that was kind of standard procedure for a lot of kids growing up, you know, in my era. And uh, so I, I had been on that end of it and the vast majority of time deserved it too but I'd never seen something like that what had just happened 
And we're sitting out there on this front step, and I'm just talking to him about it. I was like, man, has he ever done that before? And, and, all, and, and my friend, his scalp was hurting, as you can imagine. And he was kind of going like this, and uh, he had a bunch of hair in his hands. I mean, you know, his uncle had pulled out a bunch of hair. And uh, it was crazy. And I used to remember thinking how wild that was, and I couldn't understand it. And for the longest time, I didn't understand it. But as I got older and I became an adult, and then I started having my own kids and all of this, all of a sudden, little by little, I started understanding it. Not to excuse that particular approach, because there was nothing appropriate about the way that he went about doing that. But now I understand better the whole idea of, of how he was being disrespected under his own roof and treated you know, like that, and he was irritated by it. I get that now. Okay, but the way he dealt with it was inappropriate. But, but, but that's the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here is, is that we're not just given just a grunt response or a, a, a meaningless greeting to people. What, what the scripture is talking about is something that is heartfelt, something that is more intentional, something that communicates a message. I am glad to see you. And, and that you're all in, you're in the moment. Okay, that conveys value to a person. All right, let me show you number two. What does value, valuing people look like? It includes thoughtful consideration of others' well-being. Thoughtful consideration, where, where you actually think it through. I think this is one of the best verses that communicates this particular principle. It's in Philippians chapter 2. The tail end of verse 3 and all of verse 4, it says this in the New International Version. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. There's really an important concept here that, that you're not just valuing others as yourself, you're valuing others above yourselves. This is the kind of... The, the kind of uh, um, approach that we are to have with people around us in our life, whether they're in our family or they're outside our family, that's beside the point. We value them above ourselves. We don't just look out for our own interests, but we're actually giving thought to the interests of others, what this particular person's thoughts and needs might happen to be at a given moment in time. We're actually thinking through that. I mean, there's several other scriptures I could use to illustrate the point. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says people should be concerned about others and not just about themselves. Or, or 1 John chapter 3, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? All of these passages are communicating the same thing. And basically what they're communicating is that we should not approach living our life in the way where we're living with tunnel vision where all we're focused on is what we've decided to focus on, kind of like putting on blinders, and we're not noticing anybody in the peripheral vision because we're, we're, we don't have peripheral vision. We're just focused on our agenda, what we're planning to do, what our schedule dictates, and that is, is what we're focused on. And all these passages are saying, no, that's not the way we should go about living our life. And Jesus is a great example of it. That passage I showed you two slides ago, Philippians chapter 2, where it says, value others above yourselves, that actually is a lead-in verse to several verses that all talk about Jesus and talking about how he is the great example of this. And Jesus does serve as a great example of this. For example, think about when Jesus was on the cross. He had been crucified. We know, and we touched on this last Sunday, that there were six hours that Jesus was on the cross. I don't know at what particular point in time that what I'm getting ready to say happened. It might have been an hour, two hours into it. It might have been four hours into it. I don't know. But in John chapter 19, it says specifically, while Jesus was hanging there on the cross, he saw his mom, Mary, and he saw standing right next to his mom, John, one of the disciples, 
Now, it was hard enough, historians tell us, it was hard enough for a person to just breathe when they're hanging on a cross, let alone talk. But yet, in the scripture, we do have short phrases of things that Jesus said, uh, several things that he said. And this is one of the case in points in John 19. He specifically said, woman, behold your son. And then to John, he said, behold your mother. And that verse ends by saying, from that day forward, Mary lived in John's house. So John totally got it. John and Mary, they understood that what Jesus was doing was he was looking out for his mother. He wanted to make sure that she was going to be taken care of because he was about to die. In another, what, hour or two, he was going to die. But yet, even in that moment in time, he had been flogged. He was hanging there, crucified to a cross. And and yet, where was his mind? His mind wasn't focused on himself. He was thinking of others. And, And that's the way Jesus lived his life. Let me show you a passage that actually is recording something earlier, you know, a couple of years earlier in John or in Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 and 36 it says this then Jesus went to all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom when he saw the crowds he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd What that passage is telling us is that during Jesus' ministry, as he would travel from point A to point B and go to these different locations, these different villages and all, he was was looking into people's eyes. He was looking into their faces. He was recognizing the fact that people were weary, people were struggling, people were empty. And that can be illustrated in so many ways from the various stories that we read in the Bible. For example, Jesus, when he went out to sit by the well outside of Samaria while the disciples went into town to round up some food in John chapter 4, Jesus ended up uh, bumping into uh, who we affectionately refer to as the woman at the well. We don't know her name. But Jesus gave her his undivided attention, struck up a conversation. Jesus also recognized within her that there was an emptiness. There was a void inside of her that she was trying to fill with all these different relationships that she had had all these marriages that she had been in and now the relationship that wasn't even a marriage. And, and, and Jesus was picking up on some of this stuff. But you see, it's because he wasn't focused on himself. He was focused on others. On another occasion, we have Jesus walking along, and it's kind of like this whole caravan of people, not just his disciples, but a lot of other curiosity seekers and and all as well, hoping to see him do a miracle. Some people, honestly, just wanting to hear him teach, hearing what he had to say because they recognized he was a rabbi. And, And so they're walking along, and there's a couple of blind beggars alongside the road, and they start calling out as soon as they hear that it's Jesus, because Jesus now has a reputation in the area, and they're calling out for Jesus. But some of the people in the crowd started hollering back at them, hush up, don't bother the teacher. But in that text, what did Jesus do? He puts the brakes on, stops everything, goes over, gives them his undivided attention, because that's what Jesus does. That was the way Jesus operated time and time again. Another occasion, Jesus had been called upon to go to this house where a child was dying. And so he was headed that direction. And again, there was a big crowd of people, people pressing in. And somehow this woman who had been struggling with an illness for 12 years was able to wedge her way through that thick crowd to get to Jesus and just touch the hem of his clothing. And Jesus noticed that. And he puts the brakes on, he stops, and gives her his undivided attention. The 12-year struggle that she had been going through. And he helps her. But that's what Jesus does. Jesus lived life with his eyes open. In contrast to that, people tend to, and many of us have been guilty of this as well, We live our lives with our eyes closed. 
We already know our agenda. We know what it is that we need to do. We got our schedule planned, and so we move forward, and we don't need to be distracted by anything because we're focused on what it is we plan to do. And so in a manner of speaking, we're not living our lives with our eyes open because we're kind of blowing right past people and not even looking them in the face. People we interact with, we don't really look. We don't really pay attention. You know, Saturdays, a lot of times a day, I try to catch up on a lot of errands. And so sometimes, you know, there can be three or four hours of errands that, that I'm doing, you know, running around and, you know, 18 different people I might have conversations with or in order to check things off of my list. And at the end of the day, I stop and I think, I never really, never really genuinely conversed with any of those people. I mean, it was just to do what had to be done, and then I was out of there. You see, that's living with your eyes closed. Jesus lived with his eyes open. He was dialed in to people around him. And if we're really going to value people, we need to be more like that. Number three, if we're going to value people at times, it involves rearranging your schedule for others' sake. The classic example of this is the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. You remember the story. There was a guy that was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And that was a road that you, as a rule, you didn't travel alone. You just, you tried not to. Because there was a lot of hiding places, a lot of rock, you know. Um, it just, especially at the end of the day or after nightfall, you did not do this. And if you could, you traveled in groups of people. But this guy was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and some bandits jumped him, and they beat him, and they stole all of his stuff and left him bleeding, lying alongside the road. Well, the next thing that happens sometime later is a priest comes walking down the road. Again, he's going from Jer uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. So what is assumed here is he's put in his day at the temple, and now he's headed home. So he's probably tired. He probably wants to go home and eat a good meal. He perhaps has some children. He wants to hug and kiss his children, you know, before they go to bed and all. So he's got an agenda. He's got a schedule. And so he's walking along. He sees the man, the text tells us, bleeding there beside the road. And so he goes on the other edge of the road and just walks on by. Sometime later, a Levite comes down there. A Levite as well would have some responsibilities in the temple, the temple courtyard area. He does the same thing the priest did. Probably put in a long day. He wants to get home. And then this third guy, and this is the Samaritan, he's coming along. He spots the man that's lying there on the ground, and he goes over to him. He stops, gets down on his hands and knees, and he bandages his wounds and tries to nurse him as much as he can back to health, or at least to stop the bleeding and all. And then he loads him up on his animal and takes him to the next village. Maybe it was Jericho. Maybe there was a little village before he would get to Jericho. But he went there anyway, and he found an inn, and he took him into the inn and, and started caring for the guy's needs. And then after a while, he went to the innkeeper, and he paid the expenses that, that had been um, made thus far, but he gave the instructions to the innkeeper, and he says, hey, if there are, I want, I want you to take care of him until he's able to leave on his own. And if there are any more expenses that he racks up, I'll be coming back through this area and I will pay it for myself. I'll take care of it. And of course, the whole thing that that story in Luke 10 is illustrating is how we love our neighbors. And a big part of the story is that we need to be willing to go out of our way. We need to be willing to drop what, whatever our own agenda is on occasion you know, to, to help someone who, who might have need. I mean, think about this guy who had been beat up and kind of left for dead. Um, think of how he felt after this Samaritan did what he did. Because what the Samaritan did is sent a very loud and clear message that he had value. I mean, with the priest and the Levi, he probably just felt like he was worthless because they just walked on by. But the Samaritan, the way that he treated him, 
sent a very, very different message. This guy was willing to be inconvenienced. That particular story immediately brings to my mind some of the words of Jesus that he taught early in his ministry in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, where he said that if someone demands that you go one mile, be willing to go two miles. Go the extra mile with them. And that's where that phrase comes from, is, is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaching that. And basically, back in that day, because of Roman occupation, the Romans, they, they had the authority to demand someone uh, to carry their gear. You had to drop whatever it was you were doing. If a Roman soldier come up to you and said, carry my gear, but they were limited, they could only force you to carry it for one mile. And that's why the Jewish people actually had mile markers out from these towns. It's kind of interesting where mile markers, you know, back in history, they were there for a different reason than what mile markers are all about today. But they, the Jewish people, they knew exactly once they hit that mile, they dropped the gear. They were done. And they wanted to get back to their life. But Jesus says, if someone does that to you, go the extra mile. Go two miles. See, again, illustrating the whole idea of being willing to rearrange your schedule for the sake of somebody else. You think about Jesus as he was at the Last Supper. You know, in that room, there was a person who was going to betray him later that night. There was another person that was going to deny him um, three times. Um, later that evening. And yet, in the middle of the time in that upper room, Jesus recognized that uh, no one had done the basic responsibility of, of washing the feet before a meal because you traveled with the kind of shoes that you had and the majority of people walked back in those days. You know, this was a common courtesy thing that you would do before a meal is someone would wash the feet. A servant or someone would wash the feet so people could be comfortable. Nobody did that because no one wanted to lower themselves. But now Jesus, he goes, gets the basin of water and the towel, and he goes around the room and he washes all their feet. Now, was that convenient for Jesus to do? We don't know exactly when that fell during the meal. Um, the scripture's a little bit ambiguous about that, but uh, it, very well possible Jesus was leaving food right there on the table in front of him. His food was getting cold. It, it, what, it, this was his last meal. He was going to be arrested later this night. He knew all of that, and yet he willingly did all of this. And it sent a very loud and clear message. If not at that moment, in hindsight, it certainly did to the disciples. Rearranging your schedule and giving of your time sends a clear message to the person who's on the receiving end. And that message is that you value them. Number four, it also involves what might seem to be trivial stuff. I wanted to include this because there's actually multiple biblical examples of this. Um, and, and I would say a cup of water is an example of something trivial. Today, we'd say a bottle of water, but uh, um, I would say that would qualify for this. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, whoever gives just a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. What this is saying is that even something small like that is something that God makes note of. God notices and he remembers just a cup of cold water. Now, a person could look at that and say, well, yeah, but that's talking about that we do this for someone who is a Christian, someone who is a disciple of Jesus. All right, I, I, granted, that verse makes reference to that, but the principle certainly isn't limited like that. You look at passages like Galatians 6. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Notice that? Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So, yeah, it starts in the church. This is part of, part of the way we are to function within the church family, the family of God, that we're looking out for one another's needs. We're going out of our way, even if it's little trivial, little things that we're doing for one another. The fact is we're doing them. But what passages like this are teaching is that it should bleed out from there. It should overflow into the streets. It should, it should involve people that aren't a part of the church family, people in our neighborhoods, people 
people that we know and work with, but people that we don't know as well, that we should be serving them even in some of these very same ways. We are made for this purpose. If you are a Christian, you are made for this purpose, and I am made for this purpose. In the very passage that talks about how we're saved by grace, and we sing a lot about amazing grace and everything, and that very passage, Ephesians chapter 2, says we're saved by grace, not by works, so that anyone should boast. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And we're really familiar with that because that is a very important doctrinal passage of Scripture. But do you remember what the very next verse says? The very next verse, right after establishing how salvation is possible, the very next verse, verse 10, says this. It is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. That's why I say we are made for this purpose. God didn't save us just so he could put us on a shelf like a trophy. <laughs> that, that wasn't in God's mind. He wants to impact the world through us, one life at a time. And you have the wherewithal to do that, and I have the wherewithal to do that. And it may not always be in monumental ways. It might be in seemingly trivial ways. But yet we can make a difference. We have the ability to brighten people's lives. And that's part of God's plan because it sends a message that God wants to see sent, that people have value. And then we got number five. It is something that you already know how to do. And I've decided to include this one on here because I can hear it now that the way some of our minds work is that we're thinking, you know what, you know, valuing other people, that is really a good point, and it's obviously in the Bible and it's something I should do. I just wish I understood how, how to actually go about doing that better, you know, because then I'd be able to do it. Well, this is the point. You already know how to do this. You already know it. You just may not realize that. Jesus boiled it all down to one verse. In a very real sense, he gave us the key to unlocking the potential in our relationships. It is so basic, yet so effective, that we can start improving most of our relationships overnight just by following this verse. Our relationships at home, our marriage with our kids, with our coworkers when we go to work, and with people in the neighborhood. Here's the verse. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And I'll, I'll read it to you in the message. It says, here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. We call this the golden rule. Usually, we remember it by do to others what you want them to do to you. You know, we, 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 we memorize it in one of those translations. But I really like the way it was worded here. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. So that's the question that you and I both, we need to be asking ourselves on a daily basis. How do I want people to treat me? This person over here, how do I want them to treat me? I mean, especially if roles were reversed, how would I want them to treat me? What would I want? Well, see, once you've determined that by asking that question, and it's not going to take long for you to come up with an answer, now you have your assignment. That's what you need to do. There you go. It wasn't that complicated. How do you want people to treat you? There, there it is. Treat them. How do you want your spouse to treat you? How do you want people in your home to treat you? How do you want people in the office to treat you? Now you've got your answer, your assignment as to how you can show them value. If it's something that would bless you, you can pretty much count on it. It's something that will bless them. If it's something that would benefit you, then yeah, odds are it's going to benefit them. I want to close by giving you three statements that I believe are true and I think really help to drive this whole 
this whole message home. Three statements, and I believe all three of these statements are true. Number one, every person you meet has value. All right? I don't think there's anyone in here that would necessarily argue with that. We all know people have value. We're all made in God's image, right? doesn't matter how many degrees a person has or doesn't have, whether they've got multiple PhDs or whether they've just got a GED. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change their value. It doesn't matter how many people may be working underneath them, you know, jumping every time they give a word of instruction or um, a rule or whatever out in the workplace. It doesn't matter if they're in that kind of a position or if they're just out there working for minimum wage. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change their value. Every person that you meet any given day has value. Number two, every person you meet is struggling with something. I want to add this, and it's based on my observation of 50-some years of life, that this is true. Everybody is struggling in one way or another. Now, we're fully aware of that in regards to ourselves. We know some of the things going on in our own life or in our own family, but oftentimes we don't even stop to consider that in the lives of other people. That distant coworker that you have, there may be a very good reason she is so distant and not engaging, and she kind of avoids people. Her home life may be miserable, but she doesn't say a word about it. She doesn't say a word hardly at all, and that could be what's behind all of that it could be that cashier with an attitude that cashier you're just like i can't believe the attitude that that he has well if you were in his shoes and you had some of the issues going on that he's got going on right now in his life your attitude might be every bit as bad or maybe even worse it might be that angry customer or client As soon as the phone rings and you see their name or they come walking in the door and you're just like, oh, good grief, how long is this one going to take? Because it's just like they got a chip on their shoulder. But you know what? If you were in his shoes and had to deal with maybe the fact that he just lost a parent and now he's also got the care of his other parent he's trying to deal with, in the meantime, his own kids are just giving him daily grief you know, with various things, and they're just not abide, abiding by any of the house rules. And he's just, he's just got a headache all the time, and he still has to carry on business. If you were in his shoes, you might very well be angry as well. You know, we, we, uh, we talk about how, uh, you know, Facebook, you know, one, one of the, the, the things that's commonly said about Facebook is, um, Facebook's kind of artificial because you just kind of project the image that you want people to see. It's not necessarily the truth about you or your family or your marriage. You're just kind of giving people a glimpse in the window, but it's what you want them to see. You're manipulating it by just showing certain things. And so that's one of the strikes against Facebook that you commonly hear people um, say stuff about. But the reality of the matter is, and I'm not trying to defend Facebook. I don't do Facebook, but but... The reality of the matter is people have been doing that for a long time. Manipulating the image that people have of them. Projecting a certain image and hiding maybe certain things that they really don't want people to know about. One of the things that I've found is is through counseling and stuff like that, that at times, sometimes it's the most unlikely people that come in and start sharing a story. that It's just like, whoa. I would have never guessed. I would have never guessed they were going through that. But they're sharing it in confidence. And and, and, uh, so I'm not going to use it as an illustration in a sermon. And, you know, but but yet it's eye-opening on this end of things to just be like, whoa. I didn't see that one coming. But, uh, wow, it does make sense. Um. Yeah, everybody's struggling with something. Then number three, every person you meet provides you with an opportunity. If everyone has value and everyone's struggling with something, then every person you cross paths with provides you with an opportunity. You may be um, interacting with someone tomorrow morning that uh, has not had a kind word spoken to them for weeks. 
In fact, the things they've been hearing has just been a barrage of, of belittling, hurtful criticism, and, and that may be all that they've been hearing for several weeks. And you've got the opportunity to give them their first word of encouragement you know, that they've heard in the longest time. You might be dealing with some people this week that are struggling to keep it together emotionally. You've got an opportunity to give them strength and encouragement. You have the opportunity to bring a little sunshine into people's lives. Now, I want you to think about this while our ushers get up and prepare for our time of communion. The reality of the matter is everybody wants to be a somebody. Everybody wants to matter. That doesn't mean that we want to be the mayor or we want to be some hot shot that is recognized by everybody in the city. I mean, a lot of us actually don't like that idea. We, we, uh, we wouldn't want that. But nonetheless, we still want to be a person that matters in people's lives, in our circles. You have the wherewithal through your interaction and the words that you share to accomplish just that, to express value. God may very well have put you into some of these people's lives that you're a part of for this very reason. And so I want to close by just saying this. Might you and I both, because I know I need to do this, and I'm going to assume a number of you need to do this, might we be more intentional to live our lives with our eyes open? Let's stop living our lives with our eyes closed, just doing what is on our schedule to do any given day. Let's live our lives with our eyes open, okay? Let's dial in on the people that cross paths with us, and let's be difference makers all to God's glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for for the opportunity, the opportunities that we have that you place before us every day. And Lord, maybe hopefully today your spirit will take this that we've talked about and use this to prompt us, to remind us that uh, this is what we're made for. We are made to reach into people's lives and And to be a blessing, to be of benefit, to help them to better understand the love of God. And it can be in big ways, it can be in very small ways. But Father, help us to be those people to your glory. Might your spirit guide us and bring that conviction to our hearts. During this time, while we take the bread and the cup, we reflect on the most convincing act of love um, we've ever experienced where you expressed our value in a clearer fashion than anything else could have and that is through the giving of your son Jesus Christ. We take the bread and the cup and we reflect on that love and my prayer Lord is that it will inspire us to be all the more a blessing to others. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.